My job tonight is to ask, is it possible for a crowd like this to leave this room loving fairy tales more than when you walked in? I don't know if it's possible. I'm going to try, because I'm pretty sure most of you already love fairy tales. Um, and so I want to thank Great Hearts for the invitation to come here. This is the first time that I come at such a conference. Um, I've taken on in the past few years uh, the, uh, the task of retelling some of the classic fairy tales. And I think that it's because we're at a very interesting cultural moment. We're noticing that a lot of the guardians of those fairy tales for the past decades are dropping them. They don't want them anymore. They're too dangerous. You know, they're too messy. And so, you know, but those stories, they've lasted for all these centuries for a reason, because they have something, even if we don't know what it is, they have secrets in them that still awaken our attention and our memory. And that's why they've been transmitted for so many generations. So I think that now is a great time for us. It's a great time because it is the moment where we can show the world these treasures again as they're being forgotten. It's a wonderful time. It's like those fantasy stories where you know, the, 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 the broken world discovers this ancient treasure of an ancient civilization that, that people are forgetting. It's, a, it's actually a very exciting time. Um, and so I'm going to take you through a vision of fairy tales, which is related to the ancient perception of the, the music of the spheres. Uh, the, the notion of the music of the spheres, of course, comes from uh, Pythagoras uh, being retold in the Timaeus by Plato tells this strange story of Pythagoras, who has this theory about how the spheres are making music, the heavenly spheres, that is these, the, the, mo the motion of the planets in the zodiac. They have a proportionality. And you can see it in the, the, the slide where the, it, this is an actual truth, that the proportions between the planet is e equal to the musical system that we use in the West. And so between all the, the different planets, it's, it is exactly the same as what you would find on, a, on a people doing their chords on a guitar. It has, it has that structure. And so this beautiful vision of how this, the motion of the planets are actually musical. I remember when I heard that story when I was in college, early in college, uh, it was presented to me in a very ridiculous way, almost materialist way. You know, the ancient had this idea of these solid spheres that moved and vibrated and made music, and then we forgot the music. And uh, you can see it, like Aristotle criticizes uh, Pythagoras for that and says, no, it would make too much noise and it would, it would be annoying. And, it, you know, uh, and I, I don't know if I'm allowed to criticize Aristotle in this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> um, luckily, the, the theory per, per, continues and, you know, into the, the mathematical uh, ideas, and you see Kepler re-bringing these ideas once again and saying that, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the idea that there's a sound in the sense of a physical sound that you would hear, but that the patterns, that the patterns that the heavenly bodies make, they are akin to more, to deeper patterns, to the patterns by which we live. And that is exactly, in some ways, what music is. Music is a pattern. It is a pattern that we recognize as being a pattern. Uh, we're so used to hearing the word pattern. It's like, what, what does that mean? What is a pattern? What is a melody? Why is it that we can hear a bunch of different sounds and we can recognize that those are one thing? Why is it that we can hear a chord, that we can hear different sounds? but they con they're consonant. They come together, and their variability joins together in a common voice. And all of a sudden, you hear one sound. You hear one melody. You see one pattern. The pattern is made of a bunch of things, but that pattern nonetheless appears in its unity. And that's why it can be repeated. And that is, of course, what music is. That is what the dance is. That is what all of these, the idea of the music of the spheres can help us understand. Um, and so in the Middle Ages, you still have this vision continue. They don't use the word, the music of the spheres. But all of a sudden, you have this image of the incarnate logos at the center of the heavenly spheres. So you can see around the logos, around the, 
heavenly man, you have the signs of the zodiac that are turning around him. And, you know, whether you're Christian or not, you can still understand the idea, which is that in our world, we experience pattern as purpose. We experience pattern as reason. We experience pattern as, you know, participation, as order. But all of that moves towards reason. You know, the, if I have a pattern of behavior, it is always towards a purpose. And then we realize that that's what patterns are actually for. Um, and so every time that we experience multiplicity coming into one, every time we experience variability that suddenly appears as it's moving towards purpose, what's happening is we are experiencing the music of the spheres. We're experiencing the pattern of the cosmos. And it brings us great joy. Every time you see a great pass in a football game, you're experiencing the music of the spheres. Because you see these several players moving, and all of a sudden something happens. He throws the ball, and the other person is exactly in the right place. For some reason, they're not even looking at each other, but they know where to be, and it let, he, 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 he catches it. And we rejoice. Why do we rejoice? If you break it down to its elements, it's pretty silly, right? Why do we rejoice? We rejoice because we see multiplicity come into one. We see action move in pattern towards purpose. And so we experience the, move, we experience the music of the spheres when, when we see a cook make a great meal. Because they take all this stuff, this, the, the meat, the vegetables, the spices, they bring them together, they mix them up, but not just mix them up. They move them towards purpose. And so when we eat the meal, we rejoice because we're experiencing the music of the spheres. We're experiencing multiplicity move into pattern, multiplicity move into purpose. And so this, the, this image, the image of the, the heavenly man, if we can put it up again, of the heavenly man that is at the center of the, of the, of the spheres, you know, it can help you understand a lot of the aspects of that story, you know, that's why, for example, when he's born, there's a, there's a choir of angels. A choir of angels is the same as the heavenly spheres. It's just exactly the same. There's no difference. Right? It's just music coming from above. Something which is revealing to us the great pattern. Something that's happening in the world which is hiding in it a greater purpose and, and a higher pattern. So it's the same when we see people dance. We also have that, 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 that pleasure. It's like, why do we enjoy dancing? Especially dancing with someone else, right? Because then all of a sudden you do see this multiplicity come together. You do notice that you're moving in unison with someone else. That all of a sudden, you know, you act and they react and there's this back and forth. And that is the music of the spheres. And we especially experience the music of the spheres in in a great conversation. Uh, the, uh, the cognitive psychologist John Verveke talks about dialogos. He explains this idea that when you enter into a real conversation, and everybody has had that experience, where all of a sudden you're carried, you know, and, and you build on each other's discussion. So maybe you push back a little, but you nonetheless bring the person further, and they push you back a little, but nonetheless you're brought further. And all of a sudden you notice that there's almost like a third being in the room. That there's almost a third reality, which is the conversation itself. And you know that that, that third reality would, could not exist if you were alone just thinking about whatever you're thinking about in your room. You know, and the great theologian Bulgakov saw that reality as an image of the Trinity itself. That this capacity to enter into conversation or into communion with someone else, coming into common purpose, and that common purpose appearing as the frame or as a, as a third reality in our, in our communion, that it was an image of the Trinity. And so this image of the 
you know, the music of the spheres is something that continues on uh, until today. But what does this have to do with fairy tales? My contention is that fairy tales are like tuning forks. Fairy tales are mechanisms by which we participate in that music, but also mechanisms by which we train ourselves in the grammar of that music. And so it's both a participation, but it's also a training. And the way we can think about it, we can think about the origin of fairy tales. You know, this is a speculative origin, but you'll, you'll notice that it's not, it's not that far-fetched. And so you can imagine a great way to think of fairy tales. You can imagine a bunch of grandmothers in villages telling stories, you know, telling stories that are and noticing when they tell certain stories with certain aspects that all of a sudden people's attention perks. And they're like, oh, now they're listening to what I'm saying. And then the person listening to that remembers that when their grandmother told that story, people were paying attention. And so then they tell the story in the same way. Maybe they modify it a little and they notice, oh, when I modify it too much this way, well, don't, it's not, nothing to this is conscious, by the way. They notice that when they, when they modify it a little bit this way, then people stop paying attention. If they modify it this way, oh, then all of a sudden people are paying attention even more. Now imagine that happening over 40,000 years. Right? And so salient stories that gather attention, that are remembered, and are transmitted, and nobody has to know why. Nobody has to understand the story. Some people do, but most people don't. And that actually doesn't matter. All that matters is the attention, the memory, and the transmission. Because the music of the spheres is the meaning of things, right? It's the purpose of things. It's the way that the pattern comes together. And so when you remember something, and when you transmit it, you're participating in that game. You're participating in the game of meaning, in the game of relevance, maybe is a best, better word even to use. That the stories that are relevant will be transmitted and remembered by the very process of storytelling. And there's almost no way around that. You know, for the same reason that certain TV series become more popular and are remembered, for the same reason that certain songs are more popular and remembered, it's because they have something in them that capture more attention. And you can measure that over, you can do a, how can I say this? You can do a shock version and get, get attention, very short attention. And then some people will do that, you know, even in the music sphere, but usually that attention peaks and then goes away. What happens over time is that the regular pattern of attention gets remembered. And so the stories will find, will kind of move up and down, will, 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 will change, but nonetheless will keep to transmitting that capacity for attention, for uh, memory, and for transmission. And so it's a very, it's a very powerful, it's a very powerful vision because what it means is that you can trust the fairy tales. You can trust those stories that have been transmitted over thousands of years, hundreds of years. You can trust them even if you don't understand them. Because they must necessarily manifest the pattern of human cognition. They must necessarily manifest the pattern of human attention, of human memory, and that music of the spheres. And so we have, therefore, in these stories, we have very powerful tools and you know we change them to our peril we're actually dealing with the Chesterton fence situation here is that when we come up to the stories and we try to modify them too much we're actually we're actually in you know especially if you're dealing with children you're actually in danger of twisting their attention luckily on the in the long term the twisted versions will go away. They just won't be remembered. 
you know, the, the political ones, the ideological ones, all these twisting of fairy tales that we've seen in the past decades, they, nobody will remember them in the long term. The, the damage can be short term, sadly. Uh, and so we, still, we have to be attentive to that. We have to be attentive to the short term damage that changing them. But what we know is that we can trust these stories because they do contain uh, this powerful structure in them. And in that way, I would say that they are undistinguishable from myth, you know. And in a similar way, I would say not as much. They are very close to scripture. They're not exactly scripture, because scripture is elevated, you know. The fairy tales are not elevated. They're just remembered, transmitted, and therefore they definitely contain the basic structure of reality in them. For some reason, we have certain texts, we have certain stories that we elevate on purpose and we put above us and we all look to them as shining beacons. So those stand above, but they're very close. Fairy tales are the closest thing to scripture that you can find besides scripture because they have that same, uh, the, the same code or the same underlying structure of reality and the, this capacity to perceive meaning and to transmit it. And so one of the great things about the fairy tales right now is that especially for you, all of you that are teaching, those of you that are teaching children, is that, you know, the Iliad was not meant to be read, ultimately, you know, and you all know that, right? The Iliad was told around the campfire. The Iliad was told to warriors who came back from battle to help them return, to return to their land, to kind of go through the process of all the horrible things they have done by by participating, by remembering, by engaging with the great heroes of the past that had, had to make the same types of sacrifices, made the same types of errors. And so it was really a participative act. The Iliad was a ritual text. And we have very few of those left. We're so used to entertainment culture, and we're so used to passive reception that we've forgotten that these stories, they're meant to participate. And just like the great conversation that I mentioned at the outset, how the great conversation participates in the music of the spheres, well, that's what telling a story, to a, a fairy tale to a child does. Especially if you do it by, while you're being attentive, being attentive to the child. Not just telling the story, but watching the child and watching how the child responds and interacting with the child as you tell the story, you're, you're, you're really participating in that, that great cosmic music. So it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity that we have because we, it's, it's one of the last remainders of the ancient world that we have, the capacity to sit with children, you know, in a classroom, in a group, around a fire, you know, as you're tucking them into bed and tell them a story. You know, this is one of the last remainders of these great worlds that we love from the past. So we have to cherish it. And we have to really engage with our children in that vision and understanding that it's not just about information. When you're telling a fairy tale, it really is a tuning fork for reality. And um, in ways that often we even don't understand. The fairy tales have cosmic structures. Fairy tales are not morality tales. I hope you, if you've read the grim fairy tales, you probably know that. It's like, try to find the moral story from Puss in Boots. Like, really, try hard to find a moral story out of Puss in Boots. Very difficult. But nonetheless, we tell the story. The children love it. They remember it. We don't know why. Because fairy tales are not moral stories. They have morality downstream from them. But actually, just like the Bible stories are often not, not moral stories, especially the Old Testament stories. We, if we can actually stop thinking that that Old Testament stories have to be moral stories, we probably could appreciate them more because then we go in there and we're shocked at every story because it doesn't fit the way we think things should happen in a, in a nice, decent, Puritan moral story. Uh, so the fairy tales don't have that at all. The fairy tales are, they are cosmic images. And like I said, I think it is the, the time to enter into it in a way that... Uh, that is living. And so this is what 
what I've decided to do now for the past few years, because of what I've seen happen in the world, I decided to kind of enter into it. Um, because it's also dangerous, I think, especially for uh, people that love classical education, to just see the fairy tales as texts and say like, oh, we're gonna read them grim. Well, the truth is that Grimm didn't make up these stories. They didn't come up with these stories. You know, we're gracious to them because they translated them, because they, they, they collated them, because they told them in a beautiful, poetic way. We have to be grateful for them for that. But all of them, the Perrault's, the Grimm's, all of these people that brought the fairy tales together, none of them wrote them. So we have to be careful not to treat them as we treat a novel, for example. You know, it's like little women and fairy tales, they don't inhabit exactly the same world. The fairy tales is like a grammar, right? It, it is like music. And that's why they rhyme with each other too, right? The fairy tales look like each other. You know, oh, wait a minute, why this woman falls asleep in this fairy tale, and then she falls asleep in this fairy tale, and then, you know, it, and, and you see like, there are these things that repeat each other. And then you, you think, oh, she eats an apple and she falls asleep, that looks like another story I've seen in the Bible somewhere. I don't know what's going on. But you notice that these stories are different. They have this kind of grammar of repetition, a pattern, that musical pattern. And so that's the way that we, that I'm encouraging you to engage with them, is that yes, of course, read the kids the grim version, but also enter into the grammar of the stories, right? And see how you can actually play with it to some extent. And I think that that's something that's possible to do with great reverence and love for the stories. And so I'm gonna take you just quickly through our project that we're, get, we're embarking on. So I've started now with eight fairy tales. I'm going to tell eight of the most known fairy tales that, that, that you can imagine, Snow White, Cinderella, Jack and the Beanstalk, you know, Rumpelstiltskin, all the very, very known ones. But enter into them with that desire to, first of all, celebrate them, but then also a desire to play with the musicality of the story. You know, and so I've also noticed that when Snow White eats the apple, she falls asleep, and that looks like a story in Genesis. So I can add a few little details in the story to make that more salient. I'm not gonna change the story, right? I'm not going to twist it and turn it, but I will bring out or make certain elements shine, you know, to kind of participate in the great symphony. It's a good way to think about it, you know, and to, to, to add my voice to the symphony of the stories. Um, and so we have, and one of the things that's interesting that's happening now as well is that there are a lot of, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of artists that are tired of the way culture is going. And you'd be surprised how many there are, writers and artists and musicians. And now is a really great time. You, uh, pay attention for the next few years. You're going to see things shake because a lot of the artists are checking out and they want to now move into a, a rekindling and a recapturing of these ancient stories in a powerful way. And so I was able to get an artist for this book who, who was a designer for all the great franchises, right? All the Disney's and the, you know, and the Marvel's and the Harry Potter and all that stuff. Uh, and so, but nonetheless, her love of the true fairy tale made her want to move on to a project like this where if you tell a, and it's so funny because, you know, if you tell a literary agent, I'm gonna write a version of Snow White, and they ask you, well, what's your take on it? And it's like, no, there's no take on it. I'm actually gonna tell the story of Snow White. Uh, and, you know, and, it, and it's funny because obviously nobody, I mean, soon people will understand. But at the outset, people wonder what's going on. But, you know, nonetheless, we sold out the first print of the book I was actually supposed to have books tonight, but I don't have any because we just sold out all the books. And so the moment is, is happening, like the moment is clear. So what I want to do is, um, I want to take you through a fairy tale. And um, this is actually a fairy tale that we're going to tell, but I want to kind of take you through it to help you hopefully see a little bit of how it is a cosmic story even though it is couched in rather silly imagery, you know, and, and things that, you know, stories that we've heard since we've been 10 and that 
the type of story that the, the new atheist will mock Christianity as looking like. It's like, I, I'm happy that the Bible looks like Jack and the Beanstalk, because Jack and the Beanstalk is an amazing story. It's an amazing cosmic story. Um, so we're going to go through Jack and the Beanstalk, and we'll hopefully you'll be able to start to see how we can play with this and how this makes sense. All right. So Jack and the Beanstalk is also a story that I'm fond of right now because a lot of the fairy tales that have been popular in the past decades have been about, have, have girls in them. And a lot of the fairy tales that I'm telling also will have female protagonists. This one is a story that has a male protagonist. And it's interesting because I think that it has to do with that as well. It has to do, just like Snow White or Cinderella, to some, to some extent are the, the, the transition of a young girl to womanhood. I think Jack is also about that for a young boy. So we kind of look at it and see. Um, so Jack doesn't have a father. That's important in the story, I think. He has two things. He has a mother and he has a cow. Now, fairy tales are sometimes quite on the nose and there's a relationship between the two in the story, you know, because the, the cow is obviously the creature that provides the milk for the for the family, you know, and now his mother is his guardian. And so he's an 11 year old boy, 12 year old boy. It's not clear in the story, but he's a boy that's right on that edge where right? he's going to start to change. His mind's going to start to change. His body's going to start to change. Uh, and he's going to start to realize certain things. And so he's missing something in his life. He doesn't know quite what it is yet. He doesn't understand it, but he lives in this world with his mother and the cow. But things are so dire because they're missing that which provides and that which makes his, could make his family continue. They're missing that. They're running out of body. It's a good way to understand it. They're, they're just running out of food. They're running out of wealth. They don't have anything left. And so at some point, his mother becomes desperate, tells him, go sell the cow you know, basically, we'll buy some food, we'll eat, and we'll die, you know, like, it'll be, that'll be it for us, you know. Similar to the story in, uh, in, uh, of Elijah and the widow, by the way, very similar in terms of the structure, okay. And so, Jack goes out, and he sells his cow. So I'm going to show you some, these are some images from our book, I'll tell you when they're from our book, just so you can see the difference. Um, so Jack goes out, and he sells the cow for beans, match beans. It's really interesting because right in the story, of course, it's presented as a trick. And in some ways, it is a trick. But the question is, is it really a trick? What is he trading for? What is he, what is he trading? Right? He, he's trading the cow for seed. That's what he's trading for. He's trading it for a seed. What's a, what's a seed? A seed is a pattern without body. It's the best way to understand it, right? That's the, maybe the, 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 that's when Christ talks about the mustard seed. That's what he's trying to refer to. It's like, it's a, it's a, it's a pattern that doesn't yet have body and that it has to then find body and it will grow. But it's a meaning, right? It's a purpose, but it's still small. It doesn't have body yet. But it's also, you know, it's interesting too, like you, in the 20th century, you've had all these people tell you that fairy tales are all about sex. Um, and the truth is, they are about sex. They're not just about sex. And that's the difference, is that the cosmic dance involves sex, guys. Like sex is part of the cosmic uh, sphere, the, the, the music of the spheres, right? It is a pattern of communion. It is a pattern of dance, of coming together, you know, of, of, of the, 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 the finding of purpose and of meaning and of life. And so the imagery will always contain some sexual aspect to it, but it's not just that. And if we can see the whole picture, then we are not afraid of the aspects that are, to some extent, reflect that, right? And so this is also reflected 
in this question is that he finds the seed. That's what he's missing. He's missing his father, right? And he's also missing, he's also entering into a world where this will become relevant to him, right? He's discovering this aspect of the world, okay? So that's part, that's part, of, the, that's part of the story. Now, you know, his mother cannot recognize the seed. She doesn't recognize the value because of her role in the story, because she is the widow in the story. She's the, she's the woman who doesn't have a husband, you know, and because of that, their family's in trouble. And so she can't recognize it, tosses it out, tosses it out, of course, and then overnight, what happens? The beanstalk grows, and when he wakes up, there's a beanstalk there in the morning. Now, there are so many stories that have that similar structure, right? The beanstalk is, is Jacob's ladder, right? It's, the, it's Yggdrasil. It's, you know, it's the pillar, of the axis mundi, if you like that type of language, right? It is the thing that connects heaven and earth. It is the hierarchy of being. It is the music of the spheres, right? It is, that's how the ancients understood these heavenly spheres that went up as a hierarchy of purposes and of truths that went all the way up into those stars that don't move, that are fixed, that, are, that, that don't move, that aren't part of the dance, that are beyond the dance, right? The prime mobile, right? That's what Dante goes through. Dante experiences layers of meaning, layers of purpose, layers of virtue as he ascends the heavenly spheres to reach the highest point. And this is exactly the same as what's going on in this story. This pillar appears, which connects heaven and earth. And, you know, but it is also, it is also Jack waking up in the morning to the beanstalk, right? And so it, it has a sexual element to it, but it's not just that, right? And it's, uh, you know, and it's the same even like Jacob, Jacob's pillar is related to all of this symbolism, but it's not the same. It's not just that, that's what I want to say. I just want to help you when, when the, the postmodern will tell you that, that, that uh, fairy tales are only about sex. It's like, yeah, get over it, you know? They're also about higher meanings and, you know, and those are more important. I don't know what to tell you, right? And so Jack climbs the beanstalk, but before he climbs the beanstalk, it's important that his mother wants to prevent him from climbing the beanstalk. Because his mother wants to prevent him from climbing the beanstalk for the same reason that she couldn't recognize the seed at the outset, right? And that is also the 12-year-old boy that has to now find his own purpose, that has to, you know, has to find his way out of the house slowly and progressively but has to find his own purpose. And that is what Jack is doing. And so he climbs the beanstalk and he comes to the giant. And so this one is also from our book, a future book. Now, this music, okay, what's important to understand is that this music, like a fugue or, you know, it's fractal which is that the pattern that it shows you will always repeat itself in the parts of the story. So the parts of the story are like little mirrors for the whole story, right? Does that make sense to you? That's what a fractal is. It's like, it's a pattern that repeats itself at every single level that you can recognize, okay? So when Jack enters into the house of the giant, what happens? The woman wants to protect him, obviously. What does she want to protect him from? She wants to protect him from this giant man that's going to devour him. <clears throat> Will the giant man devour him? Yes. Does he have to confront that? Yes. Right? Those are all true. All of it is true. And is the woman kind of right to want to protect him from that? Of course she is. Right? Of course she does. She wants to protect him from the evils of hierarchy, the evils of masculinity. All of that stuff is real, you know? the tyranny of the, of the father, all of that stuff exists. But nonetheless, Jack has to deal with it, has to encounter it, has to confront it. So what does he get from his first encounter? 
So he goes up three times. I don't want to make this the longest story in the world. He goes up three times and he gets three things. The first thing he gets is gold. And he brings the gold back down. Now, what can he do with the gold? He can buy food. Problem solved. It's great, right? We had a problem. We don't have enough food. I go up into heaven. I get the solution. I get the reason. I get the purpose. Then I bring it back down. Then I solve the problem. Right? That's what we do all the time when we solve a problem. We go up into heaven. We find the reason. We find the purpose. We find the solution. And then we come back down and we implement it into the world. Okay. But then what happens? The money runs out. Hmm. He didn't go high enough. Or he didn't get enough from heaven. Because what's better? To solve a problem? Or to know, to solve a single problem? Or to understand how to solve problems? Right? Understanding how to solve problems is a much better skill than solving a particular problem. Right? I can know how to hammer a, you know, a nail, and I could do that all day, but if I understand carpentry, then I can figure out all the things that are downstream from that. So what's the next thing Jack gets? Goes up there, and he gets now the cause of riches. So riches are one thing, they're great, but how to make money is way better than money. If you know how to do that, it's much better. And all this time, what's really important is that Jack is also sacrificing his immediate needs. And that's what he did at the outset. He's learning, you know, to uh, delay pleasure. He's learning to delay his immediate desires. Because, you know, milk is good and getting food is good. And that's why when he goes up, he always asks the woman for food, if you notice in the story. He goes up and he asks her for food. But then she puts him in the cupboard, tries to protect him. And then he adventures out, goes out, deals with the dangerous man and then gets the treasure. And the, the second thing he gets is the way to make money. That's great. Now he comes back down. He's pretty much solved all of his problems. You know, now he can just generate wealth. He's good. He's a businessman. He knows how it works, right? He, he doesn't just know how to run a dry cleaner, but he knows how to run several companies. He's good to go. So he can become rich. It's all good. There's something missing, it seems, and something's itching, right? Something's itching at him. He feels like there's something more that he hasn't gotten yet. He needs one more step. So he goes back up. Same thing happens, but this time, the weirdest thing, right? How do you, so you, you get gold, then the chicken that lays eggs, makes sense. Why is the third one a harp? That's weird. I hope you've been paying attention from the beginning, because now you know why it's a harp. Right? Now he's getting the pattern. He's getting the pattern that cannot be spoken. He's getting the origin of all the other patterns. Right? He's getting the harp that sings. He's getting the music of the spheres. That's what he's getting. And that's the highest thing. He's getting the pattern of reality. And now he brings it back down. And it's not clear, like, what advantage in material terms this harp is going to bring him. It doesn't seem like it's going to bring him any. But it's the beauty of the song, right, that attracts him. <clears throat> something more than just his belly. Something more than just the desire to solve the problems. Right? He's lifted up into something higher, something that transcends those desires. And he's capable of perceiving it because he, all this time he's been sacrificing, to some extent, those little desires for higher purposes, right? And we all know, right, that's what education is, right? You know, when you tell a 10-year-old boy to sit still, it's like, what are you doing? You're saying, sacrifice your immediate desire for something more. And, and you'll thank me later, you know, because if I... <laughs> If, you, if I let you do whatever you want, and I let you eat all the candy, and I let you do whatever, you know, you'll be miserable. And, we, you know. and so Jack discovers that. Right? Jack finds that as he ascends the hierarchy. 
Now, <clears throat> you know the story. You know the story more than you think, right? This story, the story of Jack, is very similar. It's actually almost the same as this story. It's almost exactly the same as the story of Moses. What happens? What happens to Moses? Right? He's a shepherd. He's got a good life. He's got, he's got a wife. He's got kids. He's good to go. And he sees this glimmering thing. It's not a seed. Oh, it's a burning bush. But you get it. Right? He sees this shimmering thing. And then ultimately that leads him to sacrifice all, to go through great difficulty in order to ascend the mountain. Now, what does he get at the top of the mountain? He gets a pattern. Right? What do you think law is? That's what law is. Law is a pattern of behavior. Right? And in the case of the law that is given to, to, uh, to Moses, it's not just a pattern of behavior. It's, first of all, a pattern of attention. Right? You will have one God, you will worship one God. That's a pattern of attention. And then downstream from that, it's a pattern of behavior. So that's also part of the, you know, the top, the first aspect of the law have more to do with ontology, with the way the world exists. And then the second part, the moral part is downstream. Fairy tales are the same, like I told you. If you try to find too much morality in fairy tales, you're really going to, you're going you're gonna to have to twist them, and you're going to have to, to make them into something else. But if you understand that they're actually, usually ontological structures, they're showing the structure of being, and then downstream from that, you can get moral meaning. That's a much better way to approach fairy tales. Then also, what does Moses get there at the top of the mountain? He gets a literal plan for a building. He gets an actual pattern for a building. God says, you're going to make a building. It's going to be this size. Like he's like a, he gets architectural plans at the top of that. But that's what you need to understand. And why also you need to understand that, you know, the temple, the pattern of the temple is not, is not a moral question. It's, it's not moral in itself. It's not telling you how to, how to, you know, how to not steal or do all that stuff. It is, it is a pattern of participation, right? The, liturgy or the, the the way that the israelites came to the temple and sacrificed and the whole order of of the temple itself was representing the beanstalk itself right? the structure of the temple is this moving into the secret place where the secret glory of god is hidden and that's the same at least in these kinds of stories as as that mustard seed and the crazy thing about that is what does Moses find when he comes back down the mountain? He finds a cow. You know, because the people have worshipped their desires. Right? And in, they've worshipped their desires instead of looking up towards higher reality. And the sacrifice, you know, it's, an, it's, a, it's the upside down of what the story, in the story in Jack. Jack has to sacrifice the cow. He has to sacrifice the cow in order to get the meaning. Here you find Moses coming down and realizing that because the people are now worshiping the cow, the, the pattern doesn't, is not going to fit. The pattern is, has to be broken. The pattern cannot connect with that world. And they have to purify themselves so that when he comes back down again, then the pattern can connect to the people. And so this is just one fairy tale. You know, and I, and I chose one which, when I was a child, I love Jack and the Beanstalk, but it always bothered me because I was told that, that fairy tales are supposed to be moral. Jack and the Beanstalk is not moral at all. There's nothing moral about it when he goes up there, steals from these giants. If you take it at the first level, it's like, who's the bad guy in the story, you know? It's, just, it's probably Jack, right? just in terms of simple morality. It's not, it's not the giants. Like, he's up there minding his own business and someone's in his house. You know, it's like... But if you see it rather as this 
this structure of being, right, as this structure of participation, then, then it lays itself out beautifully and powerfully before you. And so, you know, my call to you is to take these stories very seriously. And, you know, so I spend all this time, you know, explaining it to you. And I'm not explaining it to you. This story has way more than what I was able to explain to you. And it's really important when you think about fairy tales that they're not, they're not metaphors for things. And Tolkien got this right, by the way, because Tolkien hated when people said that his work was symbolic. He said, my work isn't symbolic, my work is applicable. And that's the way to understand fairy tales, is that fairy tales are patterns of being that are applicable. Now, I can show you the analogies, right? And I can say, this is like Moses, this is like this, this is like that, this applies to this. And it can help you see the pattern that you didn't perceive before. It's helpful to do that because it can make you see how valuable it is. But I'm not explaining it to you, you know. Uh, and that's really important. And what that means is that two things. It means that one, you can keep telling the fairy tales to the kids and not, don't worry about it. The story will take care of itself, right? And two, you have the rest of your life as you tell these stories to the kids to realize that they have something to teach you. You have no idea. Like you have no idea what they contain, the, the, the power and the depth that they have in them. That honestly, the fairy tales are not just for kids. And they never were really. It's weird. It's a very modern idea that fairy tales are just for kids. We tell them to kids because kids, you know, they haven't forgotten how to hear the music of the spheres so much, like uh, Pythagoras said. Uh, but they're for us as well. And so I'm embarking on this, on this, on this adventure myself. I encourage you to, to embark on it on your own, to, to look through, uh, you know, look in the next few years, you'll see these eight fairy tales that are going to come out that are going to be a kind of symphony of fairy tales where we're gonna play with the rhyme and with the, the meanings of the fairy tales so that they kind of come together in this great symphony at the end. So hopefully I was able to make you love fairy tales even more than when you walked in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to have a Q&A session now, so take about 15 minutes or so. We do have a microphone down front, so I'll kick us off with a question here. Uh, but if you could, uh, if you could line up in front of the microphone uh, so that you're ready to go. And we would ask that the question be a question. <laughs> Not five minutes and then, hi, Jen, what do you think about that? <laughs> um, so in other words, try to be concise so we get more questions. So please feel free to come line up here uh, at, the, uh, at the microphone. While they're doing that, uh, I was very taken by this analogy of the football team. <laughs> and when the pass is thrown, everything's in its place. Now, I grew up a suffering Browns fan. And the receiver was never in his place. Yeah, very frustrating. I, I won't ask you what you make of it, no. Um, my question actually is, uh, you know, obviously lots of talk about these stories being, uh, in some sense, freed from a particular telling, right? Uh, they are, they, they existed before Grimm. What do, you, what do you make of the connection, though, between the story and the particular telling? Is the particular linguistic incarnation uh, important? Uh, is it important to read multiple versions of it? What, what is that connection between the, the story itself and that particular telling? Well, it's the, same, it's the same process as what was there before, is that the reason why the Grimm's were able to do that and that we love the fairy tales is because they captured something true. You know, if, and so that is something that should be remembered and celebrated, and it will be. And so, you know, I think that it's important to read the Grimm versions because they are a beautifully crystallized version that has become a marker for the way we understand fairy tales. And that has, a, there's a reason why that's the case. And so I think that 
we definitely need you know, to, to do both, to both remember the great tellers of the, of the fairy tale, uh, but then also engage with them. You know, and it is a good idea to play with the fairy tales a little because you know, we all know now that there's like 25 versions of Snow White. You know, and, and it's interesting you know, when you tell the story to a child to switch it up a little bit, to do it in a traditional way, right? To not make some stupid thing up, but to really, you know, sometimes the, 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 the dwarves are robbers. You know, sometimes the dwarves are more like, uh, are miners. Sometimes they're, they're not even dwarves, right? Sometimes they're, they're and so it's, it can be an interesting way to help the child know what analogy is. And totally unconsciously, by the way. One of the things I did when I was telling the fairy tales to my kids is I would always pause when there was a rhyming point, when I would say, you know, like Snow White falls asleep and I'd say, where did you, where have you seen that before? And then they'd, they'd remember other, they'd say, oh yeah, Sleeping Beauty also falls asleep. And then you don't even have to explain it. Just let them see the analogy, you know, especially if they're young, like six, seven, just let them see the analogy. They're learning the, the language without you even having to explain it to them. So let me be a, a little bit more pointed with this. Uh, why publish a new version? Oh, because I believe that there are things in the fairy tales that are appropriate for the context. So this is the great thing about stories like this, is that their wealth is so immense that there are certain things that you can make shine that are relevant to the moment. You know, a simple example in the, the, our version of Snow White is there are two versions of this, the mirror. One is a mirror on the wall, one is a mirror in my hand. And, you know, in our version, we made it a mirror in my hand. And if you saw the image of it, and she holding the mirror in her hand like this, it's like, oh, okay, I understand. One of the aspects of what that can apply to, this, this narcissism and this, this, this black mirror that you know, tells you who's the most beautiful. You know, it's like, and so, so those, those are little things, but these are, but, and you don't betray the story at all. You just tell the story of Snow White, but to make certain things salient, I think is important. Eric. Thanks, Jake. Jonathan, thank you. I thought that was great. But more of a point of clarity or a question for clarity. So what I heard you suggesting is that the, let's say, let's call them the important aspects of fairy tales are attention, memory, and transmission. It seemed that you were, at least this is what I heard, that memory was not, or it was something separate. Is it? Is that a fair understanding of, uh, was there a delineation there that, oh, sorry, that meaning, did I say what? memory? Meaning, that meaning was a different. No, but the, the, when I talked about attention, memory, and transmission, I was just talking about the mechanism by which we have them, which is that fairy tales are not just about those three things. They're, but the, the fact that attention, the way that humans pay attention, the way they remember things, and then the way they retell them is a beautiful way to understand why the fairy tales have come to us and also why they contain a pattern of consciousness in them because of those three aspects. But are, are those in your the, mind? The, meaning, the yeah. meaning is there, but usually you don't, how can I say, an, an, illiterate, an, an illiter illiterate grandma is not gonna tell a story because it's meaningful. Right. Like not in the way that we think meaningful. You know, when you, you think about it, like when you're telling a story around the fire with your kids, you know, you're not thinking about like how meaningful is this? You want them to love it. You want them to pay attention. You want them to be enthralled. You want them to follow along, you know. But you might. I mean, so, so where do you see the pedagogical implications of that when, when you're putting the fairy tales forth? What do you see as the, the highest end, right, of that transmission, right, of this thousand year old yeah. story. Well, Do, should, the, should the teacher care about the meaning at all? Is, or, or is that not the important aspect of the telling? Like wh when you use the word meaning, what do you mean? Well, I mean it in the sense of what you did. <laughs> um, so you took us through uh, the images themselves. Not necessarily that the, maybe the t kindergarten teacher would do exactly what you did with us but maybe to some extent to draw out applicability. Yeah. Right, and, and so I'm just wondering what the pedagogical import of, of that so, is. So, 
The first thing I would say is that in the same way that I don't think you would ask what the pedagogical import of learning to play the piano is, it's the same here. That is, learning the grammar of being is not, it's not a, like, a, that is beyond the specific application. It's like learning how to, learning how to play well with your friends is more than pedagogy, right? It's learning to be human. It's learning to be, to, 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 to dance in that pattern. And so the fairy tale is like a tuning fork for a person in terms of meaning. So it's, it actually, in some ways, is, is more than, it's more than its applicability. And participating in the fairy tales precedes the application. The applications can be great, but if the applications are always secondary, and they can be fun, you, you can actually have fun with kids, because you can do it as questions instead of doing it as, as a teaching. You can ask the child, why did Jack do this? Why did Snow White do this? You know, why did Snow White, why was Snow White, why is it that, she let the queen in, you know, and you can do it that way. And then the child will be forced to think about it in their own context. And they will, they will find applications. You can teach the applications too, but I think, anyways, I think that the, the music of the spheres aspect precedes the, the simple pedagogical aspect, if that makes sense. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. Uh, the most difficult part about coming up here is not doing what Jake just said. So I'm just going to ask the question. Uh, are fairy tales, is the purpose of fairy tales different for adults than for children? Um, and or is there something different adults are supposed to get out of it than children are? No, I think, I think yes. I think adults can get more out of uh, different things out of fairy tales. And it has to do in some ways with the, the play. So, you know, um, it's the same with music, right? It's like when you start with a child, you say, you know, just play the, play the piece. Like, you know, you do, do the different exercises and they learn the exercises. And then as you get older, at some point, then you can listen to a fugue and you can notice the great things that Bach is doing you know, and taking you out of the pattern and then hinting at it and teasing you and then bringing you back. And, this, and you can actually more consciously see what's going on. And I think that that's what adults can do. Is that now, you know, and it's actually fun, as a, especially the fairy tales you know really well as a child and that you, you knew. And to, as an adult, now go back and say, I'm going to take this seriously. And all of a sudden, you can see these beautiful things. Uh, they, can, they can unfold riches in a more conscious and intellectual way that is that can be quite, quite fun, and more than fun, but that can actually reveal to you some deep mysteries. Actually, even about scripture, by the way. There are some things that I've understood in scripture that I understood because I was reading fairy tales, that all of a sudden I was like, oh, that's one of the things that's going on. And, and because it, it's close, but it's not. And so it makes you think of the scriptural story differently, and it kind of it reflects back on it, and you think, What's the, why is it different? Why is it the same? And then you get these insights. Yeah, and that, that makes a lot of sense. For kids, is there something, because you mentioned at the end of your talk, there's things they see that maybe it's harder for you to see as an adult. And just any more about that. That there's things that, I'm know. sorry, I didn't understand. That, this, that the students are seeing or the children are seeing that's They'll maybe, see it implicitly. They'll see it implicitly by their attention. It's like, a child loves something. And if a child, a child, children love fairy tales, you don't have to explain the fairy tales to them, especially now when they're super young. They just love to hear them. And so it's like rejoice, like rejoice in that. It's wonderful. They love the stories, you know, and then as they get older, then you can tease out the applications, you know. You could, I mean, it would be a great idea, for example, for an education program to go through the fairy tales, let's say, three times in the cur curriculum. You have them in kindergarten, first grade. You just read them to the kids. You play with you play with them. You know you have them memorize them. You do them as poems. You do them as plays. You just get them to to do them. And then you know maybe at around like I would say like 12 years old, then you go back into them and then you see what fruit that those patterns have produced. And then you know like senior year of high school, then ask a senior to analyze a fairy tale and to do it like the structure of it and show 
how its literary references to be able to, to demonstrate how you know how the the, the, var the variability and how it looks like this myth or it looks like these other things. You know, I think that would be a great way to do fairy tales. Thank you. Thank you again for your talk. Um, I really appreciate your caution that we over moralize story and particularly with fairy tales take that approach but instead take a ontological approach to understanding how reality works but i'm curious to understand particularly for those of us who are uh, tasked with ordering the loves of children cultivating virtue in children can you say a bit more about why that approach is more effective than an over moralistic approach that I think is more common in a modern sense. I mean, I think you've answered your own question. You know, it's like you can't, you, the world is made of love. Dante pretty much demonstrated it to us. Like it, it's built out of care. And I think that it's some way, it's a way that we can, it's, it's something that we can argue quite strongly today with, 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 with the new developments in cognitive science that the world is actually made of care and that the orders of cares are the orders of identities. Like there's, there's almost no, there's no difference between the identities of things, their purposes, and the hierarchy in which we engage with them, right? The, the fact that we care about them or not. And so, you know, the, if you can get, you know, and everybody knows that, right? If you can get a child to love something, then you've done, you don't have to do any more work. That's it. They'll do it themselves. And that's what, like, I grew up, I, I, I did a lot of homeschooling with my kids, and you know, we were kind of around homeschool people, and that was the case, you know. In the right context, like a homeschooled kid that loves something, they'll just, like, they'll take off, and you, you'll have to stop them. Like, you'll have to say, all right, stop reading now. You know, yeah. that's enough. Like, put that, no, that book's too old for you. Don't read it, you know. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like I, I'm fighting with my 16-year-old about what she's like, I want to read Dostoevsky. I'm like, ugh. Oh. Like, can you read C.S. Lewis instead? Like, let's get, wait until you're in your 20s to read Dostoevsky. But, yeah. You know, it's like, that's the kind of thing that the love will produce, right? Is that at some point you have that, yeah, the, the child will just take it on their own. So in just presenting that, the truth of reality, you think that's sufficient to cultivate the virtue and love for that reality? Well, the stories are, the stories are made to be loved. Yeah. I and mean, who doesn't like the story of Snow White? Who doesn't like Jack and the Beanstalk when you're seven years old? Yeah. Yeah, and you don't have to know why. It just, it just catches the kids, especially if they're not ruined with telephones. You know? But, but if, if you have a kid with a, with a bit of a healthy mind, then those stories will, will catch them, no, no doubt about it. Yeah. Thank you. You began to touch on this a few questions ago, or your answer to a few questions ago, in talking about how fairy tales have affected the way that you've read scripture. And so my question is, uh, fairy tales are often more enjoyable to read than scripture. So how can we learn to read scripture like a fairy tale? Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great question. And I think that at least it's just, this is a lesson that I, I learned hard in my life with my kids because I love scripture. You know, it's like I, I live in scripture. And so I thought, you know, we'll tell them the fairy tale stories, we'll tell them Bible stories, and they just all kind of go together. But for some reason, the Bible stories were a harder sell, you know. Uh, and, I think that, and I think that in some ways you could say that the, the fairy tales can be a way of initiating people into the language of scripture. And so they're kind of like a narthex or like an entrance to, to the church, right? Uh, because, because they have certain fantastical elements that are exaggerated. And so, you know, obviously the, you have dragons, you have, you know, giant beanstalks that go up in the sky and giants and all this stuff. There's a, some of that in scripture too, but not as, in a, as much of a salient manner. And so I think that, 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 you know, when your kids are quite young, the fairy tales can kind of help them and then slowly move into to, uh, to scripture stories later. Oh no, you can still tell some of the scripture stories when they're young, but I made the mistake of just starting in Genesis. Like, don't do that. <laughs> so, seriously, don't, don't do that, you know? So that's for a child, but for an adult who maybe doesn't, you know, read scripture in a very, uh, like, academic. Right, in that sense. Well, for sure. The, the, I think that, 
I, I think that the fairy tale is a better model for how to read scripture than the way that the modern scholar tells us to read it. You know, the way that the modern tell, the scholars tell us to read scripture makes you hate. Like, why would I read this? It's just, it's, just a, it's just a historical text about something that is actually not saying what it's actually saying, but is hiding all these political things or whatever. It's nonsense. You know, it's better to, you know, the, the Bible itself is a great, like, if you pull away from it and you're able to kind of get out of the way that the modern uh, Bible scholars have told us what the Bible is, it has this amazing pattern from the beginning to the end. You know, it starts in a garden, it ends in a city, a city with a garden inside. It has this great sweeping structure that moves right through. And you, but you have to be able to kind of pull out a little bit. Um, and, you know, this is my, will be controversial for some of you, but what can help us is the more fairy tale like stories around scripture sometimes. A lot of the legends can help you see that. Like a lot of the extra biblical traditions, if we don't take them at the same level as scripture, but sometimes it can help us see. You know, there's this amazing uh, story in the, the golden legend about how Seth goes back into the Garden of Eden and takes a shoot from the tree in the garden and then takes it out and plants it. And then that tree is used to make the Ark of Noah. And then it's preserved to the Ark and then that tree becomes the staff of Moses. And then that tree, et cetera, et cetera, becomes the cross. And you think like, that's this crazy story. And obviously that did not happen. But it's really useful for you to help you understand the meaning of all those things of all those elements in scripture, you know. And then at the end of the world, at the end, the tree of life that's planted in the heavenly Jerusalem. And so that's the great pattern of that story. And so there are all these interesting like midrash or, or extra biblical stories, both in the Christian and Jewish tradition that can really help you see the fairy tale element that's already there kind of hidden in scripture. So we have, uh, thank, you. thank you. So we have three more people. I think we can get through the three. We're a bit over time, so if uh, we can make it quicker, I think we can get through these last three. I'll, I'll keep it very short. Uh, what do you think is the relationship between fairy tales as the music of the spheres and learning or teaching mathematics? Yeah, well, it should be related. <clears throat> I'm sadly of those people that was made to hate mathematics <laughs> in my life. And I was just told that it was just a bunch of, like, so what happened? Sorry, continue. Okay. It's, it, that, we'll, talk, we'll, we'll talk later. It was, it was just a, it was told, are you, are you, it was, it was just a bunch of things that I had to learn, you know, by heart. Uh, and so I never, my brother though, is different from me. I remember he, he kind of developed a very mathematical mind and he's very close to, close to me in my thinking. He wrote a book on symbolism, uh, and he kept telling, he keep, even until today, he'll tell me like, no, math isn't what you think, you know, it's, it's something else. And so, but there, there clearly is when you see how Kepler approaches this, these patterns, like these cosmic patterns, you know, that it's definitely related. So hopefully all of you make your kids love math and not hate math. Thank For you. my sake, at least, you know. Hi, I picked up a copy of Snow White for my family and for my kids' school, and people were so impressed by the quality of the storytelling and the artwork that um, they asked me if I could get a, like a set of classroom, for a classroom set. So when is that going oh, to man. be available? Yeah. Like six oh. months, one year, yeah, two years? No, I know. It's, it's been a very, it's been a learning curve is the best way to say that. Uh, you know, I hope there, because, you know, we, we, we sold out the first edition. And the person that was running the publishing company that I own, you know, uh, it's sad to say she just wasn't the right person and I had to let her go. Uh, and because we literally oversold a thousand copies and we didn't have the books. So now there might even be people in this room that are waiting for a book and they've been waiting for like four months, five months, it's crazy. And so we have ordered books now, they should be there in a month. And so we should reopen the, the, the sales, but we're, this is also a long-term project. We don't want to rush it. So we have two more books that are being illustrated right now, Jack and Rapunzel. And so we're going we're gonna to put those out in the fall probably. So the distribution aspect of it will hopefully we'll find a solution as these kind of come out. But the quality we want to maintain 
like world-class quality. That's our, that's our first goal. Will uh, there also be extra copies of, say, God's Dog to purchase? And also, um... Yeah, that's also a problem. We also sold out those books. We sold out all our books. I don't know what to say. And yeah. we just, they're, they're excellent. That's yeah, well, thanks. A, yeah, we're also, doing, we're also doing graphic novels for those who, who, who don't know. I, I, the two graphic novels, one, uh, it's called God's Dog, and it's basically, uh, it, it is in some ways what, we're, what was asked before. It is a way of telling, of y telling a Tolkien-style epic but with the biblical world and taking all the fairy tale elements in the Christian tradition that people want to ignore and just putting them all in one story. So we have like giants and the Leviathan and St. George and, you know, like just, and the, and dog headed men and all this kind of crazy stuff. So it's coming. <laughs> okay. And also, are there other people who are doing this? If we want to provide resources for classrooms that you'd recommend? Uh, that are doing, the similar things that I'm talking, that, exactly, that I'm trying yeah, to do. Because this seems very unique yeah, to me. Yeah, I, I think that it's coming. I don't know if it's, I think that it's going to happen very fast. I was, you know, I knew <clears throat> two years ago, I had an inside it, from Disney, insider from Disney tell me that Disney was making Snow White for the 100th anniversary of Disney. And when I heard that, I thought, they're not, they can't do it. They can't make Snow White. They, they just are not allowed to. And so they, they and, and, and so, and that's exactly what happened. They just, they just basically refused to make Snow White as they're making Snow White. So it's like, she's, you know, there's no prince, there's no kiss, there's no dwarves. It's like, what story are you telling? I don't know. It's not Snow White anymore, you know? And so, and so that was one of the, imp the one of the impetus for making, for starting this series was to, re was just this wake up call to realize that actually people are dropping these stories. So let's just take the, take the flame, you know? And I think that we're going to see that happen pretty soon because that's the future. I don't know what to say. It really is. You know, and this is something about, by the way, about Disney Snow White that people forget is that the idea that Disney Snow White is just this old fashioned story and this old fashioned movie is hogwash. That is not what was going on. When Disney made that movie, they were, it was the raging, it was the rage, end of the raging twenties. It was all jazz and all crazy and drug use and, and the animation studios that were popular were doing crazy hallucinatory kind of, uh, you know. Uh, and so when Snow White, when Disney made his version of Snow White, it was a desire to recapture the traditional story. And he won. He won the attention game. And I think that that's where we are now. And I think that all you people here that's the edge that you have because people have forgotten the Iliad. Oh my goodness. People don't know that story. It's like, tell that story. It's an amazing story. There are so many stories. Now everybody's forgotten them. It's like, tell the story and people will love it because it's amazing. So we, the opportunity is immense. Sorry. Hi, two quick questions. Two quick questions. I run a K through eight. I read the Snow White. I thought it was amazing. I noticed two patterns that I wanted to ask you about. When Snow White's going through her purification journey, you have those beautiful words about the thorns, her journey. And then the book ends that way with the villain enduring her own purification. But I noticed that the literary pattern was repeated. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Because I want to pass it on to the students at my school properly. Well, it's a long, it's, it's, it's going to be a long story. And so, let, so uh, it's because it, what happens at the end of the story in our version of Snow White is that the witch it ends up in the dwarves cottage. So she leaves the, she actually leaves the castle and she's kind of forgiven by Snow White and she leaves the castle and she ends up living in the forest in the, in the, in the dwarves cottage. And so that's a promise of her story. So it's not, the story isn't over. Okay. I just really enjoyed it. And then the romance that's blossoming, the words that you use, it spoke to me of song of songs, do not yeah. stir love before it's time. Was that? Yeah, deliberate? that was definitely on purpose. Okay. So one of the things we wanted to do, one of the things we wanted to do in the, in the, in the, in the fairy tales is actually use, use scripture to solve some of the narrative problems. That's what Snow I White. saw. And yeah, that's, that's how right. I want to teach it to the kids. <laughs> 
but I really wanted to make sure I was on the right track. Oh, you're definitely on the right track. Because right. I really believe that actually, like I said, I said scripture is, scripture is higher than the fairy tales. And they actually offer some solutions to the fairy tales. That, because there are some narrative problems in the story. And some of the postmodern people pointing it out, you know, we get annoyed with it. But sometimes they might have a point. It's like, you know, what gives the right of the prince to kiss Snow White? Like, what is going on there? It's a, it is a little odd, you know. So, and so what we did in our version is that the, Snow, the prince meets Snow White at the outset in the, in the castle. And he, he, he's attracted to her, you know, and, and he's a little too forward with her. And he says, like, come with me, I'll take you into my kingdom. Like, basically, well, you know, it's a, a, well, it's a, we are rapture, like, I'll take you away. And he comes to kiss her, and he, she says, do not awaken love before it's time, which is quoted from the Song of Songs. Uh, and then at the end of the story, then he basically remembers, we don't even say that he remembers, but she told him what to do, right? She, she's the one who told him what to do when that would happen. But it's like, but it's scripture that is kind of giving you the key. We do that a few times in the story. There's a, like, especially with the apple too, we tried to kind of show how the story of Adam and Eve is actually the key to that, to the, to the story. I thought it was magnificent and I've been waiting for something like this. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm happy. Thank you. Well, Jonathan, uh, what a great way to kick off symposium, uh, talking about conversations, start with story. Uh, makes a lot of sense to me. We really appreciate your time here and we uh, hope you you have a chance to be with us and stop by some of the breakout sessions. Some of them are, are quite relevant to this. Uh, and we'll make sure that we get you into one of the sessions on mathematics. All right. <laughs> <laughs>